Welcome everybody to this uh, training workshop for the Invasive Strike Force Survey Program. I'm really excited that you guys took time out of your day to be here and think about being a surveyor. Um, it's a really exciting program. You're going to learn so much, uh, not only in this presentation, but just when you actually go out there and survey for us, just about the plants and even animals that you're seeing around you. Um, just, I just wanted to go over a little bit of what we're going to be talking about today. Uh, I'll give a little bit of an overview of what the Invasive Strike Force is, uh, what the Lower Hudson Prism is, and how that relates to the Trail Conference. My name is Brent Boscarino, and I'm the Invasive Species Citizen Science Coordinator with the New York, New Jersey Trail Conference. Um, I'll be going over what this, uh, the PRISM is. I also work for what is called the Lower Hudson PRISM, which is, and uh, the Trail Conference is the host organization for that. We'll then get into like Invasive Species 101. What are they? Why should we care about them? And what is the, what's our importance uh, or what is our role in basically protecting those native habitats uh, from invasive species? We'll then talk about what citizen science is and why the invasive strike force was basically generated and uh, what, what its role is in citizen science work. This is also a good reminder to make sure that everybody is muted. I can hear uh, somebody signing up and just make sure there's gonna be a lot of us today and just make sure that everyone is, is muted as well so we don't have a lot of interference in the background. We'll then be getting into plant ID. So what are the general features that we should be looking for in categories? Um, you guys are here because you're interested in, in becoming an invasive strike force standard surveyor. That means that we're gonna learn about 14 common invasive species in the Lower Hudson Prism region. Uh, so I'll be going over some slides and then doing some virtual field IDs. We can't be out there in the field together right now. So I'm gonna show some videos of me out in the field and identifying plants. And then we'll, I'll get into the next steps. So how to follow this up with a uh, protocol, like basically a data collection and reporting protocol. I'm gonna send you a link to a pre-recorded version of that and you can watch it on your own time. And as soon as you do that, you'll be ready to go and, and uh, get a trail assignment from us and then become a, uh, an official surveyor. And just a last reminder for those who just signed on to please stay muted to avoid background noise in the webinar. And um, I'm going to try to mute all now. And we will now we'll really get started. All right, just a little bit of an introduction as to the trail conference. So we're an organization, a nonprofit that uh, is, made, is really volunteer powered. Uh, we have over 2000 active volunteers, 9000 members from 75 different organizations all working together to basically make our trails accessible and fun and getting outdoors and, and enjoying what we're seeing along our hikes and in our natural areas. Over 10,000 volunteer hours are given annually to our parks and we help manage uh, over 2,000 miles of trails. And it's really through the work of you guys as volunteers that really helps make this happen and power our organization. Um, we work in over 190 different parks and nature reserves in northern New Jersey and the lower Hudson Valley of New York. In terms of what we do, historically, a lot of what the trail conference has done has been to develop, build, and maintain trails. So this is sometimes building stone walkways or bridges or just making sure that it's, a, it's accessible to the public. We uh, also do some uh, support and adv advocacy for open space um, and do a lot of outreach and education in terms of responsible use of trails in the natural environment. But I think what a lot of people don't realize is that we help coordinate the regional response to invasive species. And we do that through our stewardship programs at the trail conference. And we do that uh, through this uh, partnership, which is essentially called the Partnership for Regional Invasive Species Management. I know that's a mouthful. So we say PRISM for short. And we are in the lower Hudson PRISM of New York. There's eight different uh, versions of these cooperative partnerships, depending on where you are in New York State. But this is just a partnership. We do have a full-time staff that is a PRISM staff that is dedicated to invasive species management, but we need to be hosted by an organization and the PRISM in our region is hosted by the New York, New Jersey Trail Conference. All of the work we do in invasive species management is funded by the New York State DEC via the Environmental Protection Fund. 
and just a closer look at our region. So in the Lower Hudson Prism essentially runs all the way up through Dutchess County and Ulster County in New York, all the way down to the city. So we're responsible for basically protecting native habitats and our trails and our open spaces in all of this area. But here's the good thing is that we, because we're hosted by the Trail Conference, we also do a lot of our work and our invasive species work um, in Northern New Jersey as well. So we get a lot of questions. Well, you're a PRISM and you're based in New York. Well, all of the survey-based stuff in our invasive strike force also pertains to Northern New Jersey and we do all the surveying there as well. Uh, the PRISM itself is made up of 50, uh, actually I think we're up to 52 regional partners. So this is actually our group here. They're awesome to work with. We get together on uh, bi-monthly meetings and we all like talk shop and are all nature nerds and lovers and we talk about ways of protecting our natural areas. Um, we do have a full-time staff that's dedicated to invasive species management, including myself at the Trail Conference, and it's an awesome group to work with. Um, and we basically coordinate the regional response to invasive species to keep our natural areas free of, free of them. There's a lot of what we do. Part of it is removing and controlling. You might have seen us out on the trails, uh, you know, either pulling invasive species or working with our conservation core crew, which you can see here last year from 2019. If we know an area is infested with an invasive species, we can set a volunteer work day. So we have volunteers that come and help us pull. We also work in aquatics as well. So here's like some of our conservation core pulling some water chestnuts from, uh, from a lake. Uh, what you're here for is for surveying and mapping. So we do that in aquatic systems, but what you guys are gonna be trained in is looking at trail side and in our natural areas terrestrially and help us survey and map invasive species. And again, our PRISM partners get together and we help prioritize and coordinate the regional response. We also do a lot of teaching and informing. So here's a picture of me working with uh, so, some uh, younger school kids. We do a lot of education and outreach. I work with high schools as well. We have uh, boat stewards that essentially are at boat launches and ramps and do outreach and education and aquatic invasive species. And then here's a picture when we are not in COVID times when uh, this survey workshop can actually be hosted in person and we all get together and we learn about plants together. We're doing the best we can today and I'll show you some field ID videos uh, as, as to what we do. But before we really dive in, I just wanna make sure that everyone is on the same page with what I'm talking about when I refer to an invasive species. So two main terms for you guys. There is a term called non-native species and then invasive. So to be considered non-native, it just means that it is uh, an organism, plant, animal, mushroom, that is basically brought to a new place or a new ecosystem that it hasn't evolved in over time. And it, this, a non-native species, you know, could be from another country or another region of North America or the United States, and then brought here by humans. Somehow humans had a role in bringing it here. It could be cultivated or uncultivated, but essentially it doesn't necessarily mean that it's causing a disruption. It just means that it was brought to a new region where it hasn't evolved over time. To be considered a truly invasive, it has to be harmful or detrimental to our native species in that ecosystem by either significantly impacting and displacing native species. So in other words, it has to be a non-native species that is negatively influencing what is called biodiversity or the diversity of native species that we're finding in our ecosystems that, that, you know, that they've been evolving in these places for thousands if not millions of years. So I just wanted to start out and give, do a little invasives 101 with you guys. How invasive species and non-native non species get over here, it's not always on purpose that humans are bringing them here. And I'm sure you guys recognize this guy, these guys. They are all over my property. But this is the dreaded stink bug. Actually, they were accidentally introduced to the United States from China and Japan in packing crates that they were just hitchhikers along with ship stuff that we were shipping across the ocean around 1998. Most of the sightings were in Pennsylvania um, and between like 2000, 2010. And these guys are, they feed on a wide array of agricultural crops. They have this little piercing mouthpiece that they insert into fruit. So it impacts apples, apricots, grapes. 
and they leave sort of like a scar and cause the fruit to rot. In 2010 alone, in Pennsylvania, it impacted $37 million of damage in apple crops alone in Pennsylvania. So this is, this is what we're talking about with invasive species. Yeah, they are a nuisance in our property, like stink bugs, but there's also economic impacts that are, that are enormous. Um, I wanted to also branch out and think globally. We're not just impacted by invasive species here in the United States, but globally as well. I don't know if any of you guys watch River Monsters, but that's uh, Jeremy Wade, and he is holding up a big trophy fish. And what you're looking at there is a Nile perch. So Nile perch were introduced to Lake Victoria in Africa in the 1950s to basically boost the fish fishing industry and to bring in, like basically create a, a fisheries industry, bring in tourism for fishing. Um, but what ended up happening is when they introduced these fish to Lake Victoria, they started spreading to other aquatic ecosystems. And you can see after they were introduced and their numbers started going up, the native cichlids, like a native type of fish, they basically all went extinct in Lake Victoria. 200 cichlid species went extinct in that lake alone. It was an enormous impact ecologically. But the other side of that is it did spur on, you know, 1.2 million jobs and an annual catch that brought in over $700 million. So a lot of these issues that we're talking about today are complicated. You have to balance the economy with what's happening ecologically. But our goal here in stewardship, in the stewardship programs, is to really protect native habitats. And we'll talk about why that's so critical and even has an economic impact in the second. Even closer to home, if you guys ever grew up, if, if any of you grew up near the Great Lakes, you will recognize coho and Chinook salmon and uh, their introductions. I want to start with this tail, though, with this fish right here. That is an alewife. We actually have them in the Hudson River, but in the Great Lakes, like Lake Ontario, they are an invasive species and became really abundant in the mid 1900s. They're called moon eyes because they essentially, their numbers got so big, they were washing up on shore and, and a stink to them. They've got these big eyes to them. And what was, it, what was happening is that the native lake trout that were living there, could not, they were feeding on these alewife, but what, what it was causing something to go wrong in their diet. They couldn't digest these alewife, or they did, but it was causing a vitamin deficiency in the lake trout and was killing off anytime they were having babies. The babies were not surviving because these alewife had a chemical in them that didn't enable the lake trout to spawn properly. Not only that, but native lake trout were getting hit by this other invasive sea lamprey. That is a scary looking creature, right? So it was like a double whammy of these invasive species knocking out the lake trout. So what managers decided to do is they introduced coho and Chinook salmon from Alaska and the Pacific Northwest. They brought them over to the Great Lakes and all of a sudden, for some reason, there's something chemically in their bodies, they were not being impacted by these invasive alewife and that vitamin deficiency they were causing. And what ended up happening is creating this multi-million dollar industry in Lake Ontario and a multi-billion dollar industry in the Great Lakes. We got the invasive sea lamprey under control through using lamprecides and chemicals. So I just wanted to show you that these are complicated issues and there's a variety of different um, angles that managers take to kind of deal with this. What we're going to be focusing on today is the problem of non-native ornamental plants. If you will notice the vast majority of these common invasive species you see around them, around you have a couple things in common. They have beautiful flowers, beautiful fruits, and people like to look at them and plant them in their properties. The issue is that just because you put it on your property and say, oh, this is only one, one shrub. I can see it right there. I mean, we, we all know like ecologically that birds come and eat those seeds. They then go fly somewhere else. They can poop those out. And then all of a sudden you've got these, you know, these ornamentals that we're putting on our property ending up in our natural areas and causing a lot of disruption. And these are some of the ones that we're gonna be talking about today. Um, another example of an invasive species that like blew my mind was earthworms. Do you know that earthworms, almost every earthworm in the US is non-native? 
native earthworms all but disappeared about 10,000 years ago when glaciers um, uh, kind of scoured the land and wiped them out, especially north of Pennsylvania. And new earthworms really didn't enter in from Europe until about the 1600s, and they came over in root balls and ballast of ships. And I, I know I was taught since uh, I was in grade school that earthworms are great for the soil. And yes, they are awesome, awesome composters and they can recycle soil litter and stuff. But what ends up happening is that they make these little holes, like we all learned that they make holes in the soil and, and uh, you know, to aerate the soil. But a lot of our forest soils aren't compacted, right? And so what ends up happening is that all of these worms that are now in our forests, they're turning over the soil and leaf litter so quickly that it can't be absorbed by the plants in time. And what ends up happening is that when rain happen, when rain kind of falls down in the soil, it ends up going through the soil so quickly to groundwater that the plants can't take it up quick enough, that those, the water and nutrients. And then we start losing that. You ever been walking in like an undisturbed forest and you feel that like spongy duff layer? Um, that is really good for native undergrowth. But when you are heavily infested by worms, and these are just average ordinary earthworms, um, it, it decreases that duff layer and then you get all the leaching through the soil and you get a really low diversity of the, of the understory. So I found that fascinating. And so this is impacting the natives we love to see like trilliums and trout lilies and some of the spring ephemerals. Um, and we're seeing in these, the, in these forests that worms are having a major impact. And yes, they are good at composting. And, and you, know, you can use them in certain gardens, but you can't control where they go from your garden sometimes. All right, we also have seen driving down the Taconic or Thruway, all of these vines that have taken over. Um, and these are some of the worst invasives you can see. You can see just in a, a series of a year, just going from this, <laughs> completely covering this house in a natural area. This is what you would call a complete monoculture, one type of uh, invasive vine. This is probably kudzu that we're looking at here. And we also see that it uh, eats school buses. So some of the ones that we see in this area that are notorious are bittersweet, which we'll talk about today. Porcelain berry is another one that you might see. And just totally taking over, there is not much able to grow beneath that type of vine coverages. Uh, I do want to point out that just because you see a lot of something doesn't necessarily make it invasive. And then I give up the example of the monarch butterfly, which is this amazing pollinator that goes through these vast migrations from Mexico up to the Northeast. And we love seeing these, these butterflies and know how important they are to pollination. Well, um, you know, just the, we see these mass migrations, we see a lot of monarchs, but of course it doesn't make them invasive, right? These are natives that we're trying to protect. And many of you on this call will know if you're in the garden world that they require milkweed along their journey. Um, they can only feed on milkweed and there's a couple of different uh, species of milkweed they can feed on, but they rely solely on milkweed and the females have a chemical scent and a visual scent as to where to lay their eggs and the caterpillars that you can see here then feed on the milkweed. However, we have an invasive plant in our region called black and then black and then pale swallowwort that basically mimics and looks like milkweed flowers. You see that star shape there? You see the star shape to the milkweed flowers as well? The problem is that this swallowwort mimics the chemical and visual signals, but the caterpillars cannot feed on swallowwort. So they end up laying their eggs on swallowwort, and it's just like an egg dumping ground that goes nowhere because the caterpillars can't utilize that food source. So not only is swallowwort out competing milkweeds for space and taking up a forest understory, but they're also like tricking these species into not being able to uh, or into laying their eggs there, and it's not viable. So basically to summarize, invasive plants cause environmental harm by taking up space and resources that native species need, and they're somehow out-competing natives. They're crowding them out in some ways, stealing nutrients, sunlight, water, you know, the things that are critical to life. Here's a good look at one we're gonna talk about today, which is stillgrass. I'm sure many of you guys deal with this on your property. It's, it's notoriously difficult to get rid of. We talked about the kudzu vine, which is new to uh, New York State. 
um, as to why invasive species are so successful? Well, generally they can tolerate a variety of different habitat conditions. They found a way to grow and reproduce rapidly, either by producing a whole, a lot of different seeds or the seed dispersal mechanisms are, you know, are, are many and varied and very effective. They compete aggressively for resources, as we talked about before. And generally, a lot of the ones lack natural enemies or predators in their new ecosystem. It takes a while for our native species to recognize new species coming into our system as a food resource, for example. And so you all of a sudden you get this boom of this new species that has come in that our natives can't recognize. They generally have a low susceptibility to disease. And a lot of them are what are we call generalists, can they and adapt to a general variety of environmental conditions. Now, why are natives so important? Well, we know for a fact that native plants support more diverse wildlife than the invasives that are coming in. We talked about monarch butterflies, only eat feed on milkweeds as an example, but the majority of plant eating insects are what are called specialists. And they specialize on just three or fewer species of plants that they have evolved over thousands, if not millions of years to eat and feed on. And what we see is that it's not just about the plants, but with the loss of our native plants with invasive species coming in and encroaching on them, um, it also impacts the insects that are on them. And not only in terms of pollination impacts, but uh, uh, as a food source for, you know, higher up on the, on, on, in the trophic levels or higher up on the food web. We've seen insect populations decline by 75% over the last three decades. And insects are the main food for other animals, including a lot of the birds we like to see when we're out and about. And so what we're doing here as surveyors is not just about looking at plants. So here you can see in this picture, this is an invaded habitat. And yes, of course, we're trying to protect native species like maple leaf viburnums, which you see here, or spotted geraniums and, and you know, like trout lilies. I know that the spring ephemerals that we love to see. But we are also protecting native habitat and other species like bluebirds and monarch, monarchs, even fish. You know, they rely on these tall hemlocks to shade the waters that they're swimming in. So what you guys are doing is so critical to not only about, this is not just about plants, it's about protecting ecosystems. Um, other impacts of invasive species, I alluded to this before, there are huge losses economically every year to dealing with invasive species. $120 billion a year are spent on invasive species control in the United States. That is not even close to other regions like Australia, all of Europe. It is insane how much we spend on this. That's why with your efforts as surveyors for early detection of these invasive species and telling us where they are so that we can control the spread and make sure that they're not getting into new areas. Um, in terms of where the trail conference fits into all of this, well, that's you guys, that's your role. Citizen science, volunteers coming together to work with experts, I guess experts, uh, people like myself, um, to basically share data together. We have a dialogue, I can teach you about plant IDs and then, and then our volunteers can then go out and survey for us and tell us and report back to us what they're finding. So citizen science as a buzzword, you know, it just basically means that it's data sharing between volunteers, community members, and like an expert in the field. And it should be any good citizen science project involves a back and forth dialogue. And so you can, the beauty of citizen science is that oftentimes you can record a range of wildlife without like formal training. You're taking this training workshop with me and then you can kind of go out and learn as you go and then report back to us. Um, especially with our programs, you can record in your own time and pace. So I'll give you a trail assignment and then it's up to you to basically determine when it's convenient for you to go out and do it. You have, you'll have till the end of September to basically go do this survey work for us. There's lots of different citizen science projects. Nearly 2 million people in, through, in, in the world now are involved with citizen science. But here's the main key in that it's awesome. Not only is it fun and educational for you, but the data that you're collecting is used to inform and really make a difference on the ground in terms of conservation, 
management and control and basically protecting the native spaces that we all love to enjoy in the outdoors. And um, I can't reiterate it enough, like how important it is and how awesome it is that you guys are here um, engaging and, or at least thinking about do, in, involving, uh, getting involved in a citizen science project. And it's such a critical time to do that, guys. Um, I'm showing you a picture here of the Living Planet Report, which is released every two years by the World Wildlife Fund. It's essentially like a comprehensive study of biodiversity health, and it uses a variety of different metrics. And we are losing species at an unprecedented rate. Um, vertebrates, we've seen a 60% decrease in vertebrate um, diversity since 1970. It's that really actually the freshwater populations which are most impacted. And we've all heard stories about the Amazon rainforest being uh, being destroyed. We've seen 20% of the Amazon disappear in 30 years. And, um, you know, so it is absolutely critical that in our native ecosystems that we take a step forward to do something about it. There's a great series on Netflix called Our Planet that looks at the global biodiversity decline if you're interested. And what your role is, is to basically help us, met, excuse me, map and contribute to a citizen science database to protect local biodiversity. Um, and uh, in the US, I just wanna say like in the US, you'll see that some of the main causes of this are habitat degradation and exploitation globally. Invasive species in the United States are the number one threat to biodiversity in, in the US and in our regions. It's invasive species that is, that is really the largest threat to our, to our native habitats. And so what I am trying to urge you guys to do is to think globally and act locally. So I gave a lot of examples that were global examples, but now is your opportunity to act locally and become a volunteer with us. The Invasive Strike Force was born out of these ideas in 2011 to, in order to you know, manage and detect the spread of invasive species in our, in our natural areas. One of the goals is to collect information about what invasive plants exist and how abundant they are. That's what you guys are here for, is to learn about how to do that. We then use that information to identify areas where the removal of invasive species will allow us to prevent them from spreading into uninvaded communities. And then we can schedule crew work, and I'll show you what that uh, example of that in a second, and volunteer days where we can do removals and pulls to prevent further spread of whatever you guys are reporting back to us. So essentially what we're gonna be doing and what this, how the survey program works is that you're gonna to learn to identify a set of invasive plants that are commonly found along the trails and how to record information about their locations. Generally, this is a whole day training with me <laughs> that we do, part of it is in the classroom, part of it is outside doing a field walk. Well, we've all gone digital now, so um, I will show you some field videos and we'll get, we'll get it done together. But following this training is really kind of the fun part. You are gonna be assigned a one to two mile section of trail to search for these invasive species that you're gonna be learning about today. In this trail section, Usually I give assignments that are really convenient for you guys, like they're near your home, they're at a park that you want to explore, and you basically have the full field season once the assignment goes out through September to complete your section and return data to us. A lot of our newer surveyors, I would say the survey, if you're totally new at this, will take maybe, it depends on how infested the area is, but maybe like six to eight hours, six to 10 hours to complete, but you have the whole year to do it. So you can go out on a weekend, do an hour, a couple hours here, then come back, do it another weekend, or people just like to knock it off in one, in one full, full day or weekend. So in terms of where the data goes, you then report that data back to us. Here's an example of all the invasive observations that we have received. Uh, I, I don't, I, this wasn't in one year, it was just cumulatively, I think. But this is probably a better graphic for you guys. Let's take a look at Scunamonk State Park. These are all different. These are actually multiple trail assignments and multiple volunteers that went out and then reported back to us what they were finding in and along the trails of Scunamonk State Park. Well, a blue code means that they didn't find, our volunteers didn't find any invasive species there. But here you see at the base of the trailhead that we saw some 
invasive species there. We don't know at this, just by looking at this graphic, what they were. And then here's areas of high infestation of invasive species. So we can use this to make decisions as to where to go schedule volunteer removal days or how to manage that area. And of course, you're returning specific species information back to us, right? So here's a look at Scunamonk State Park and where we found Japanese stiltgrass, which we'll be learning about today. Here's an area of high infestation. So maybe we have a volunteer removal day there along that trail, but they didn't find any along the trails here, right? So this gives us really valuable information. Then we can target trail crews based on that, as I've alluded to. So here's a look at a trail that has garlic mustard on it and in a with many garlic mustard in this region. Garlic mustard we're gonna be learning about today. You might have it on your property, highly invasive, right? So this is a look at you know, what is going on trail side here. We then can use that data to, if it requires chemical removal, we can schedule our Conservation Corps crew to go out there and help with removals. I mean, we are limited by resources. We can't remove everything, obviously, but we can be strategic about where we go. Or we can have volunteer removal days at those places. So here's a before look at the area infested with garlic mustard. And then after a volunteer removal day, it is it can be actually eliminated just by pulling and having volunteer removal. So that's pretty awesome. 2019 for the Invasive Strike Force survey program was a banner year. We had over 133 volunteer surveyors on the trail, surveyed over 200 miles of trail for standard species and almost 1300 hours cumulatively. This is why your role as citizen science scientist is so important. We can't do this ourselves. We are a staff, we're a staff of basically four people. <laughs> like, and so it's volunteer powered stuff. You guys are amazing and uh, critical to this mission. And, uh, and just so, so important to what we're trying to accomplish. Uh, we recorded over 18,000 plant observations last year and a huge increase uh, due to the efforts of people like you. Um, so, you know, I've already said this before, but you know, this gives us information on how invasive plants travel and, and how to protect those habitats. And I will say that typically an assignment takes, you know, six to 10 hours, sometimes less, sometimes more to accomplish. It depends on how the pace that you go at. But if you want to, including the hours spent in this, in this training, dedicate over 80 hours of survey work throughout the summer through September, you can qualify for internship status. And I welcome people to do this of all ages. Sometimes I have high school students working with me. Sometimes it's just retired master gardeners or whatever that just say, want to, want to be like, yeah, I interned with the trail conference. So if you are interested in that, please enter that into the chat box if you're interested in intern, interning potentially and dedicating 80 hours. If not, you know, you just get your trail assignment, you start small and we go from there. So just to reiterate, why becoming a citizen science is so important. And I'm a nature nerd, I love it and love doing this because I love asking questions and learning stuff and just exploring because it's simply fun. But it's also critical to protecting the environment. If you care about the environment, it's great work that you're doing. Um, so there's a couple of different reasons why, why you can get involved. All right, with that, we are now gonna get into the science part of this and basic plant IDs. If you guys, um, I don't know if you guys need a break, we're like 34 minutes into this. Um, if you need a short break, um, why don't you take a little bit of time, like I'll, just a couple of minutes here since this is a packed, web. remember this is a full day training that I'm trying, I'm packing into like a couple hours here. So if you need to take a bathroom break, just take a couple minutes to do that. I will look at the chat box. Most of the questions I'm gonna answer at the end. I'll try to stay to two hours the best of my ability, but uh, I'll look at the chat box now. If there's any questions I can answer now in the chat box, I will while people are taking a break and then we'll get right into plan IDs.
Hey guys, um, I'm seeing com some comments here. Is that are you guys having trouble seeing my screen and keeping up? Some people are. Can you type into chat? Is it? Some people are seeing delays, but it may be a problem on their end. I just want to make sure this is not a widespread issue, that there's a huge delay between me speaking and the screen that you're seeing. OK, I, yeah, it sounds like it's good for most people. If you're having, if there is a delay, it's likely a problem on your end. So I would recommend maybe signing out and then signing back on again. Let's see, see if it's going on. Um, okay, it, it sounds like for most people it's not a problem. So if I, I saw a couple of comments that there's a bit of a delay, so that is um, that that is an issue because I'm going to I'm going to show video. So I would recommend to those people having if there is a major delay between what I'm saying and what you're seeing to sign out and sign back on again. And certainly, if you're only seeing one one slide, there's definitely a problem on uh, your end. Yeah, and uh, people are asking about getting copies of the presentation, et cetera. Absolutely. You will have copies to the webinar. I'm going to give you detailed field guides. I'll get to that at the end. But you guys will have so many resources at your disposal, uh, a really detailed uh, color field guide, a quick uh, ID guide, as well as like access to a, co a, a copied version of this webinar. All right, I'm going to get started. I think I addressed most of the questions. Hopefully, people who are having uh, issues on their end, sign out, sign back in, and hopefully that will resolve it. All right, here we go. Basic plan ID. Let's go, guys. It's science time. All right, so the first thing I want to go over is you know, how we categorize different plants. So it may seem obvious, but it's actually, you know, I just want to make sure everyone's on the same page here. A tree, there's a couple of trees on our, on our species list. A tree is defined as a single, having a single woody stem, a trunk. It's usually tall and has lots of secondary branches. It, it's, it's funny, it sounds obvious, but it actually can, can get kind of complicated. A shrub, on the other hand, is those, if you have multiple woody stems. It's usually shorter than a tree, but really, by definition, it's going to have multiple stems coming out of the ground that you can see above ground. Vines, on the other hand, can't stand up on their own. And you can have weak, woody vines or non-woody stems. In other words, like, what does it feel like? Is it kind of harder structure and have some wood to it? Or is it more like herbaceous and, and you can kind of like flexible and manipula uh, able to manipulate. But basically vines need to clamber or climb up other plants. They cannot stand up on their own. Woody plants in general just mean that they have harder stems that remain alive above the ground even during the dormant season. Uh, we also have a couple of herbs that are on our list. So herbs are things like grasses, flowers, ferns. There's nothing woody about uh, herbaceous plants. So you could be classified as a forb, which is essentially like a broadleaf plant, like a lot of our wildflowers, for example, are, are forbs, um, or grass-like. So these are grasses, sedges, rushes, those sorts of things. All right, into like how and things to be looking for when you're IDing plants in general. Well, the, one of the main ones is like leaf shape. So if you were talking about a simple leaf and what that means, you have to look at the main blade, right, of a leaf and where it connects. The connection piece is called a stalk or a petiole where the main blade connects to the stem, right, or the branch. So here's the petiole. If you see new buds like where is the new bud where's the new growth coming from if you see it at the base of that leaf at the leaf stalk or what you think is a leaf it's going to be a simple leaf so a simple leaf is like look at the main blade if it's deciduous is that the thing that's going to fall off in the fall this whole thing but there are there are also leaves out there which are called compound leaves and a compound leaf is basically like this big extended leaf that are consists of these different leaflets. 
And a lot of the things that we have on our list today are compound leaves. So let me show you an example. This picture that you have here, this whole thing is a leaf, the whole thing, not these little parts here. So for example, in the fall, this whole leaf is gonna fall off and leave a leaf scar behind it. These are called leaflets and they are just like basically make up the shape of that leaf. And at the and again, you just have to look for where the leaf stalk is attached to the main stem and this whole structure is gonna fall off. That's what makes it a compound leaf and not a simple leaf where the main blade is just that, that part is gonna fall off. So that's actually really key. We can also look at leaf and describe leaf arrangement. So basal leaves just essentially means that the main leaves are at the base of that stem. So they kind of go along the base of it, like, like you would see like with a tulip or something. Alternate leaves, and this is a really important, probably these next two terms are really key for you. If you have leaves that are alternating along a stem, it means, I don't know if you can see my hands, but it just means that they're like offset from one another. Here's, here's a leaf, then there's some space on the stem, then another leaf, then some space, then another leaf. If leaves are opposite, have an opposite pattern, it just means that the leaf is coming off the stem there, and then on the opposite side of it, there it is, 180 degrees from each other. Um, you can also describe leaf arrangement as being whirled or like all the way around uh, the, ce the, the center of the stem. But we're really, for most of our purposes, we're gonna be talking about alternate or opposite arrangement. This is absolutely key to get this down. We can also describe the branches as being alternate or opposite. It's no, no more complicated, but as opposed to describing the leaves, we're describing the branches coming off the main stem, not the leaves themselves. So opposite branching is just they're coming off opposite of one another, alternate branching. It's the same as the leaves. You're just describing the branches. We can also refer to the leaf venation and where we see the main veins in the leaves. We can describe a leaf venation as being pinnate. And a good way to remembering that is that pinnate means like a feather. And you can see this almost looks like a bird feather you just plucked off, right? So pinnate leaf venation, if, I, if you see that in, a, in the field guide that I'm going to be providing to you, like, oh, this is as pinnate, pinnate leaf structure, that's what I mean by that. Palmate basically means fan shape. The veins are going in all set, all different directions. That's like your typical maple or oak. You know, a lot of the leaves that we're gonna be talking about are palmate. Arcuate basically means that the veins are curved towards the tip. So there's an arc to it. And then some of the grasses, for example, might be parallel where the veins are running parallel to one another. That should be so pretty self-explanatory. When I'm talking about a compound leaf, I can also refer to it as being pinnately compound. So pinnate again means feather. So again, if you've got that feather-like structure on both sides of it, it can be a pinnately compound leaf. I can also describe uh, compound leaves as having a terminal or ends leaflet. You see how there's, so there's even numbers along the sides and then there's this ends leaflet at the ends. Well, that is like, that's an impartial pinnate. In other words, it has a terminal leaflet. Some of them though, don't have that like, that ending leaf on it. I can also describe leaf margins. So a leaf margin, think about margins on a piece of paper. So margins are the outer edges. So what does the outer edge of a leaf look like? If I describe it as entire, I essentially mean that the outside of that leaf is entirely smooth, essentially. It's smooth, there's no big bumps on it. Leaves can also be toothed. So meaning that they have serrations, like you know, you have like a serrated knife you use to cut a tomato with. Well, what degree of serration are they? Is it, is it serrate or doubly serrate, lots of little notches? Or is it dentate? I think dentate like teeth, like if you looked at the profile of your teeth or something, it kind of kind of looks like teeth, right? Um, leaf margins can also be described as lobed, meaning that like with uh, maple or oak trees or oak leaves, you know, they're like lobed and, and big lobes on them. And we can count the number of lobes that can give us some, some tools as to how to ID them. And then if you think about what a leaf is, right? And a compound leaf, you see how this whole thing is a compound leaf. It's all leaf. You see how it's divided into leaflets. 
right? So that's a divided, compound leaves have a divided structure to them. We can, I can also describe leaf surfaces. I'm not gonna complicate this. If you're touching a leaf and it feels smooth, I'll call it smooth. There are scientific terms for this, I'll just call it smooth. Some leaves are waxy, some are fuzzy or hairy. You can see that we'll be talking about tree of heaven today. You see little hairs coming off of it. And also I wanna talk about uh, the glands on tree of heaven today. You know, some of them have these little bumps or, or like they almost look like little nipples on them. They're essentially releasing oils and some of them are gonna, they'll smell and give it off a distinctive scent. So some of them will have glands. Um, this is probably less relevant to you guys. So unless you go out there with a knife or like cutting shears or something, I can also look at twigs. And if you have cut into it, it's kind of fun. Like a lot of the branches and twigs and stuff have filling in them. That filling is called a pith. Like a Twinkie has the cream filling in the middle or like an Oreo does, right? So I can describe what that pith looks like. I can call it a homogenous, meaning it's all one color. I can describe the color. Some of them are actually divided into compartments or chambers, and some of them are completely hollow uh, and have no filling in them. I also will use the term lenticels, which eventually, eventually are uh, essentially are little bumps on the twigs that allow for gas exchange in and out of the plants. So you see these little bumps in this picture here, these little white bumps, um, those are called lenticels and that's actually a good uh, ID feature. All right, we are ready to get into the species now. And um, you know, I would say the biggest obstacle for people becoming surveyors is they're like, all I see is green. There's no way I'm possibly gonna recognize that. And I, and I promise you, you can do it. You can do it, hang with it. Because once you form a search image, it's gonna be no different than you know, distinguishing people in a crowd. It's like, in fact, most of the green that you're gonna look looking at is really only a few species. So once you kind of get that, develop that image in your head, you'll be able to do this. And also there's some amazing mobile apps that will help you in the process. You'll have your field guides on you and lots of support from me. So um, yeah, I mean, you, you, can, you can get it done. So what clues do we look for? Now we're talking specifics. We have a general idea for things that we should be looking at. And I used to be a, a high school teacher and educator, so I always loved using mnemonic devices. So if you're out there and you're trying to remember what did Brent teach me and what are the features I should be looking for, use this mnemonic device. Let the fun begin, because this should be fun. You should be doing this not out of obligation. You should be doing it because it's fun. So the L, T, F, and B are keys. If you can remember that phrase for what things to look for. The L, you can look at leaves. You can look at twigs. You can look at the fruits or the flowers, or you can look at the bark. So if you can remember that mnemonic device and you're like, what should I be looking for? I don't know what that is. Let's, let's try that out on our first species. Okay, so if you're taking notes on your end, we're about to start with species number one. The first one we're gonna look at is the tree of heaven and these are all its key id features and i often think of the tree of heaven as like the the palm tree of the north <laughs> it's or the or the northeast it's like got a weird kind of palmate structure to it um there's a couple of features that we can look at if we use that let the fun begin if we want to look at the leaves tree of heaven has a compound leaf structure and it's pinnately compound you see how the leaflets are coming off opposite of one another Okay, so that's one key feature to look for. The leaves themselves, this whole thing can be like one to four feet in length. And here's the key, the leaves are smooth, margin. The margin, there are no serrations on it. Okay, so if we were looking at the leaves and only at the leaves, you're looking for a compound leaf that's smooth margins. If I zoomed in on those leaves, remember I showed you in the previous slide, there's a little notch at the base of those. And that notch has a little gland on it that is stinky. If you've ever removed Tree of Heaven from your yard, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. Or maybe you didn't know it was Tree of Heaven that you removed it. It smells like burnt rubber or like a rancid peanut butter or something like that. I don't know. You'll know what I'm talking about if you've got Tree of Heaven near you. It's smelly. And it's coming from those glands. You can also look at the twigs. And like I said before, you gotta look at where the, the main compound leaf falls off. Every year that falls off. And what it does is it leaves behind what is called 
a leaf scar. So it leaves behind. The leaf scar of the tree of heaven almost looks like, like kidney shaped, but I, the way I remember it is it kind of looks like a heart. And heaven, heart, love, I don't know. That's a, just a, one way to remember it. It also has lenticels on it and a brown pith if you wanted to cut into it. So you could use the twig strategy. You can also use the fruit, flower, or seed strategy. These are called, this is the seed tree of heaven. It's called a Samara. They're papery wing Samaras. And they are so prolific. These things form in huge bunches very soon. You'll see it, they'll turn like a reddish, pinkish color. You're not going to see those on the trees now. I'll show you some images of what it looks like at this point in the year. But these are what the seeds look like. They look like little eyeballs or something, right? Like you see the shape of the eye and an eyeball. I don't know. That's what it looks like to me. All right. And, or you could look at the bark. The bark to me looks like a cantaloupe rind. It's like kind of smoothish, but if you felt the outside of a cantaloupe, cantaloupe it would kind of look like this, right? Um, it can be reddish brown when younger, but then it gets a bit gray or rougher, like, like cantaloupe rinds as it gets older. All right. In profile, it could look like a sumac, and I'll be talking about ways in which it's not a sumac, but uh, it can grow like almost like a shrub-like like this. But a lot of the times I see it as it's called the tree of heaven because it grows straight up towards heaven with these really narrow, they're very unstable, straight up, and then they look like palm trees or something. Um, and that's why it's called the tree of heaven because it shoots straight up to heaven and you get these narrow, unstable uh, trunks and all the leaves are up on the top. The way you can tell it apart from the sumax, if you look, look at this picture here, you could say, I don't know, is that tree of heaven or sumac? Sumax have what are called these droops, um, or th this is what the fruit looks like on it. And also look at sumac leaves. You see the difference? They're serrated. They have little like, those knife serrations on the edge in the outer part. Tree of Heaven is smooth, right? And has the notches at the end. And they don't smell. <laughs> they don't smell like that. And a lot of the staghorn sumac, they call it staghorn. You can feel the, feel the branches. They almost have like a velvety feel to them. People also confuse it with walnuts, walnut trees. But again, you can look for other clues. If you see walnuts under the tree, for example, they, the walnuts look like this. It's not. It's not going to be tree of heaven. And then the other main thing is that it's, it's got serrations on the, on the edge of the tips of, of walnuts as well. So I am now going to show you a video. Let me know if you can see this video. Are you guys seeing a tree of heaven? Can you put your thumbs up if you see a tree of heaven in front of you? Okay, there you go. Now, this is coming out of my speakers, so it's going to be a little tinny um, and maybe like jump a little bit, but that's the, it's the best I can do. This is a tree of heaven. I just filmed this, yes, I filmed this one yesterday. So this is what it's going to look like this time of year. I just wanted to show you guys an example of what tree of heaven looks like this time of year at the end of May. So uh, you can see it's got almost like that palm tree appearance to it. This happens to be in my backyard at the end of May, as you can see it here. Sorry that the wind is picking up. But if I zoom into uh, a portion of this, and this is amongst a whole bunch of different invasive species here, there's a couple of things I can look for. Again, you can see that heart-shaped leaf scar next to it, but this is what the leaves are gonna start looking like. So right now, end of May, you're just starting to see the leaves come out. You can see that it's got that uh, pinnately compound leaf. Um, and again, you can see why it can be confused with the sumacs, but it's really not a sumac. But if you zoom in to those little notched, see those notches and there's the glands, that's your key, smooth margins edges you know that that is tree of heaven and if you pull off the leaf it is def it's got that smelly appearance to it but if i take a look at if i take a look at the leaf itself if i can unfold it here um and my hands are going to smell after this you'll see that the there's the little notches towards the end um with those with those glands you can see right where my thumb is that little notch there 
Um, so the Sumacs will not have that, and Sumacs are going to be serrated. So I just wanted to show you kind of what it looks like this time of year. It's just almost like growing little tufts of hair or something. <laughs> um, but yeah, this is what the leaves look like end of May. So it'll start filling out, but I just wanted to give you an example of what it looks like this time of year in case you went out and surveyed uh, uh, soon. Okay, other types of trees. That was our first tree. Let's take a look at the next type of tree is our Norway maples. And you probably have these on your property or have seen them around, but these are really known for very dense canopies. They were brought to the United States because it was such a great shade tree. And they've got really like broad leaves, dark green, broad leaves that provide a lot of shade. And the problem is that they start leafing out earlier than our native maples. And so what ends up happening, and they, and they stay greener longer. So they outcompete a lot of the sugar maples, for example. But there are some key differences between them that I'll show you in this, in this upcoming video that can help distinguish them. But just to give you a preview, the Norways have really pointed end, ends on them versus sugars are gonna be rounded. And I'll, I'll definitely point that out in the field video um, as some of the differences. Or you could do what is called the petiole test where you can break, break off the leaf stalk or petiole and milky sap comes out of Norway's but doesn't out of any of the others. Red maples have three main lobes on it versus Norway's tend to have five and they're really much bigger leaves. So. The only other difference that I'm not gonna talk about in the video um, is, is its seeds. So sugar maples are a little bit more varied, but Norway's, they looks like, if these are legs, it looks like Norway seeds are doing a split versus uh, sugars are not. They're more like standing more upright. And same with uh, reds are, are somewhat have an acute angle to them. Norway's are totally spread out. Um, you can also look at the bark differences between them. So Norway's, look at the difference between, you see how it's like really brown and really like patterns, like almost like a human created it, like patterns. Sugar, sugar maple barks and even red maples, no, it's like shaggier. There's no like, this is a distinct pattern of up and down to it in the bark. So I'm going to point those out in, in the field video so you guys can see what it really looks like. Um, but this is just an overview. And again, you're gonna have all of these field guides with you to help you out, but uh, that'll just be a little bit of a preview of what's coming up here. Okay, same, th same, th uh, same thing here. This is just playing through YouTube and I recorded this earlier in May. Here is a look at a Norway maple leaf. And this is at the beginning of May and look at how broad and how well grown out the leaf is already. If I zoom in a little bit closer, you will see that the edge comes to a tip. You see that tip that's coming out there, right by my right by my finger where I'm moving my finger. So sugar maple is going to have a much more rounded end to it versus Norway maple. You've got these nice broad leaves, and it has this tip that's coming off at the end versus sugar maple, which is going to be more rounded. Another way to tell is if I take it and I take off the leaf and I squeeze, you see that milky white substance that's coming out here? So if that, that milky white, okay, is not going to be coming out of the sugar maples. So that sticky white substance that's gonna come off, you see how it's even sticking to my finger there? That is a clear indication that you've got a Norway maple. But again, looking at the broadness of the leaf, and if I look up this tree, this is at the beginning of May. Look at how green that tree is. In a second, I'm gonna show you for comparison just what a sugar maple looks like at the same time of year and why the invasive Norway maple has such a competitive advantage. So again, looking at the pattern of the bark, which is a clear up and down pattern, the leaves with the milky sap, broader leaves, tips at the end, so much, much narrower pointed tips, and look at the fullness of these leaves, bigger, darker, more full, and more green at this time of year. Here is a lookalike alert. This is not Norway maple. In fact, this is a sugar maple. And you can see by the scale of my thumb, almost like probably two or three thumbs worth is. Yeah, I wanted to point out that in all of these videos, always pay attention to my thumb because it gives you a good like comparative scale. With the Norways, 
And this was in the beginning of May. Like I could put like eight of my thumbs together how big it was. And this sugar maple, maybe like two or three. So going to be the length of this relative to the Norway maple that I just showed you. Um, it's just much smaller. It's still a little bit red. In fact, you know, this is greener than a lot of the sugar maples that I'm seeing out at the beginning of May right now. But really, it's a distinguishing feature from Norway is if you take a look, remember how Norway had that point? Yes, I mean, it does have the point of the maple leaf, but you see how it's much more, it's that nuanced. That rounded this is right actually there. rounded. If you get very, very close, you see that it's rounded at the end. It doesn't have that very clear point. So if you take a look at sugar maple leaves, it's just a little bit rounder at, at the point of each of these lobes. So that's one distinguishing feature. And certainly what gives it a uh, not as much of an edge, it has it just leafs out a lot uh, later than some than the Norways do. And so it has a, just a much shorter growing season. And just imagine that the Norway just has a jump start on the growing season. And the leaves are just much, much bigger, or tend to be broader and bigger than in sugar maple. Here we're looking at the bark of a sugar maple. And you can see that compared to the Norway maple, um, it just doesn't have that like deeply grooved pattern to it. It's a little scalier. You can see that it's just not quite as geometric and, and as easy to follow as with Norway maple. Here's a look at another type of maple. Uh, this is a native maple that we have in our region. This is red maple. There's a couple of reasons why it's called red maple. We're taping here at the beginning of May and you can see that its seeds actually have like quite a reddish color to it. Um, and in the fall you'll notice that the leaves that you're seeing just starting to grow now on this tree um, will turn a nice red in the fall um, and that's some distinguishing characteristics of the red maple. Take a closer look at these seeds. Not only are they red but you'll notice that the angle on them is actually much different from the Norway maple seeds. So Norway maple seeds, if you think of these as legs and pointing down, two legs pointing down, the Norway maple seeds almost look like they're doing a split, almost very close to 180 degrees. The sugar maples, on the other hand, are a little bit um, less of an angle, maybe between 60 and 120 degrees. But these red maples that you're seeing right here um, probably have the most acute angle at about 50, 60 degrees between, between the two nodes. And again, these are wing seeds that you're seeing here. So looking for that reddish shape, more of an acute angle to the wing seeds. And uh, the other distinguishing characteristic is unlike Norway maples, which have the very clear, deep, uh, much larger leaves, which are five lobes. The red maple tends to have three lobes and the leaves are going to be much, much smaller. So yes, this is at the beginning of the growing season and these red maple leaves will grow out a little bit more, but they're pretty much going to hold this uh, three lobe shape to it, uh, at least most of the trees um, in this area. Okay. So that's a really detailed look at maples. There's other types of maples, but these are probably most of what you're gonna be coming across. All right, and just again, look at the bark of the Norway that I referred to. It's just, it's just brown ridged and, and much more organized. All right, our next tree, and this is a mis oftentimes a misnomer because it often grows at like in a shrub-like appearance, is autumn olive. And autumn olive, I don't know if you can have like a favorite uh, invasive, but I, I, they are really kind of has some neat features to them. Um, and it's really the silvery scale undersides of the leaves and the wavy appearance to it that are kind of amazing. Um, they also have a vibrant red fruit uh, that will come out in the fall that you won't see unless you survey in the fall, but they also have silver scale dots on it, which you're really looking, you can see the silvery sheen on it, even from a distance. You might still see in May the, these sort of like yellowish, whitish flowers on them. But um, I, like, I'm just going to show you what I mean by those silvery scales. They almost look like little fish scales. Um, and you'll get a zoomed in look at it here. I wanted to show you some of the key features that distinguish autumn olive from some of its uh, native competitors and also some invasive, invasive shrubs as well. So probably the key feature to really look at are the leaves. You can see this is the top part of the leaf, which has is dark green, but as I zoom in closer, do you see how it's got those little silver dimples on them? That's actually pretty cool. Um, and really, if you're driving down the road, you can actually see these things shine from a distance. It's even more dramatic 
on the underside of the leaf. So if we take a look at the underside of this leaf here and flip it over, you can see it's even more dramatic. You see those silvery scales on the bottom versus the top part, which is dark green, but almost that, that silvery cast that it, that, that it gives off and that silvery scales are really unique to autumn olive. You'll also notice that the flowers are about to bloom. So right now we're at May 1st. And you see this cluster. So they probably, they've already bloomed. I'm seeing them all over the place here in Northern Dutchess County. So they're not gonna look like this anymore, but it's really just look for the silver. They almost looks like spray painted on, but there you'll see that they're at the base of the flowers are at the base of the leaves. There are flat flowers that are found at the leaf axle or the place where the leaf meets the, meets the branch. So they, so they do form these clusters. Um, and very, very soon, probably in parts of New Jersey already, Right now we're filming in May 1st in Dutchess County in New York, and it hasn't quite flowered out yet, but you can see it's getting ready. Very, very soon you're gonna start to see this whitish, yellowish flowers. And again, it almost looks like they're like spray painted on, um, and almost like the undersides of the leaves are almost like spray painted to silver. So these are some, just some common features to look for and be on the lookout for. And you can, know, you can really see and notice autumn olive even while you're driving. The last thing I want to point out about the leaf of autumn olive is that you see how it's got that wavy look to it. This gets even more dramatic as the leaf grows out a little bit. So typically the leaves right now, it's at the beginning part of its growing season will be about one to three inches and that wavy structure will be even more prominent. I will also point out that um, it's berries typically come out in the fall time and they're red and they also. Yeah, if I had already mentioned that, so it's really the, like there's nothing like those silver scales uh, to confuse you. I mean, it's pretty obvious what um, autumn olive looks like and, and how to ID it, just looking for those silver scales. All right, our next tree is the Japanese Angelica tree. Oh, and I wanted, to, one last thing about autumn olive, it's, it's classified as a tree, but sometimes it actually grows as a shrub, like with multiple stems. So I just wanna make that clear as well. Um, okay, Japanese Angelica tree. So this is another really cool looking tree. Um, I, you're either going to see a lot of it or you're not going to see it at all. It's very patchy in our region, but it's a small tree with very, very thorny. It almost looks like a medieval war weapon. Like look at those thorns coming out of this thing. Um, it, but what its main distinguishing feature is that's kind of neat is that it is, has very large doubly compound leaves. So if you take a look at the bottom picture here, this whole thing is, it is like three to four feet long and the whole thing is a leaf. So you see how it breaks down into compound divided there and then further into um, leaflets. So it's different than say Tree of Heaven where it would just be leaflets coming off of here, right? Here it goes into a one division here and then another division into leaflets. Is that's what doubly compound means. And it has a sort of like fern-like appearance to it. Um, the leaflets themselves are gonna be toothed. And one of the main features, not only is the main stem very thorny, but where those leaflets combine here, I know it's really hard to see on my screen, but I have a field video of it. You'll see like there's thorns coming out of it right where the leaflets meet. So that is going to be like the main, main, another main feature. I know that my Zoom video is in the way here. So if, if the people's faces are in the way, you got to move your, your away or um, move the screen over. But over here, you can really see that huge doubly compound leaf. Okay. But with that, it's not letting me get out of my screen. There we go. Okay. I wanted to show you Japanese Angelica tree. I couldn't find it, I don't have any near me, but I have a potted version of it. So you should be able to see it here, full screen. Ugh, lots of moving around here, hold on. Okay. Here's a look at Japanese Angelica tree. And uh, I could not find any in the wild out near my property, but I do have a potted version of it here that will show uh, a couple of the key characteristics that uh, I had mentioned in the PowerPoint. So as you can see, this whole thing right here, all the way down to the stem, 
This whole thing is a compound, is a doubly compound leaf. And if you really zoom in and they can see on an angle, you see how at each of these junctures of the leaflets, that was that thorn on the, the, the axles of the, of the leaflets that I was talking about before. So um, those, that is a really key characteristic. They're very sharp. You can see the tooth edges of the margins of each of these leaves as well. And um, again, just look at that double compound structure. If you take a look at the um, stem of this, you can just see that it's very, very thorny where I'm putting my my fingers there, you can see the thorns that are coming out there, that like sort of medieval medieval weapon look to it. Uh, but again, some more looks at the doubly compound leaves at the bottom and the thorns that are coming out at the junction of each of those respective leaf. This is another obvious one. Like if you see it, you'll know it. It's uh, nothing else that really looks like it. Um, I guess the only thing you might confuse it with is a a uh, black locust, maybe, um, and simply because it's a large tree often found in colonies like Japanese angelica tree is. It has a similar thorny stem, but has fewer thorns. And again, you know, black locusts have these big thorns on them, but they don't have the thorns on the leaflet axles like the Japanese angelica tree does. Okay, we are now moving on to shrubs. So these are the ones that are gonna have multiple stems that are coming from the ground. So Japanese angelica tree uh, will grow with uh, one primary trunk um, oftentimes. But again, a lot of these like merge categories a lot of the times, but these are, these are primary shrubs that are coming up now. Okay, I, I guarantee you've seen Japanese bar, if you don't know Japanese barberry, it is everywhere and it's like, it's, it's horrible. <laughs> um, and unfortunately, you know, a lot of people have one on their properties too, because they make a good hedge, uh, hedge plant, but they are so invasive. Um, you can recognize it by like curved arches, branches, and very flat spoon-shaped leaves. And I'm going to be pointing out in, in the field all of these main features. And then we'll compare and contrast that with the next shrub on our list, which is multiflora rose, which also has these very distinctive thorns. But the thorns look very different uh, on barberry versus multiflora rose. But oftentimes people can get it confused because I know for me, I'm walking in the back of my property. All I know is that I'm getting hooked with stuff and I don't know what it is. And like, so you gotta look carefully at how the thorns are arranged. And uh, I'll, I'll show you in the field video how to tell Japanese barberry apart from uh, multiflora rose. So those are the next two shrubs on our list. We're gonna go to YouTube again here. Give me a second. All right. Japanese barberry, spoon-shaped leaves. Let's check it out. The key ID features that distinguish it from other shrubs that you might find in some of our forests. Let's take a closer look. First, let's take a look at these branches that I had mentioned before. So again, if you can see this almost flat, very thin spoon-shaped leaves that run along these branches. And you can start to see that there are little flower buds that are starting to appear. This video is being taken in mid-April, but by May, you'll start to see these almost whitish. Or okay, so in our region, it's already bloomed. So the, uh, at least in Dutchess County in New York, so all of these turned into flowers. They were sort of like whitish in clusters and stuff, but you're really, for Barbary, you're looking at the spoon-shaped leaves here. That's the key, that stays like that all year or uh, yellowish flowers that start to come. And they tend to come out by these little leaf clusters here. Um, another thing that I wanted to point out is that usually by the uh, end of the summertime, you'll start to see these berries, these red berries appear. And these are actually lasting from last year. So these red berries are more oval in shape and um, tend to be more elongated than some of the other ones that we'll see uh, in terms of lookalikes. And if we can get a close look at what these thorns look like, you see how they go straight up and they almost look like toothpicks? And you can get an idea for scale of both of these things from, from my hand and, and fingernail next to it, right? But almost like these very, very thick, sharp ones that had to, uh, sharp thorns that appear at the end of the leaf clusters. So that just gives you a, a, a general look at that. The only other thing I wanted to point out is if you take a look at the base of this, zoom into the base of this, 
there are multiple um, stems that are arising on this just this one plant. And again, you know, because it's so dense in the middle, you know, these harbor lots of ticks. So I got to be careful to check myself afterwards. And small mammals and rodents tend to use this as a uh, cover, which again, you know, provides hosts for some of these ticks. So these are some of the key features. And again, taking a look at, at the at the arching branches and that almost like wild look to it. Um, and we'll look take a look at some of the, the lookalikes in the area. But again, you're looking for the sharp thorns at the base, the spoon shaped almost spatula, very thin leaves and those arching branches. Japanese barberry lookalike alert. What we're looking at here is actually not Japanese barberry, but mult. Okay, this is. I just want to. If you're taking notes at, at home, uh, th this is the this is the next shrub on our list. But I put these two together because they're they can be easily confused with one another. We're going to talk about multiflora rose, and I'm going to show you some some of the images to how that differs from barberry. Multiflora rose, which is another invasive species with sort of a wild growth pattern to it. So if you're out and about and you see this almost this wildness of growth in those arching branches, it may be multiflora rose. So there's a couple of different things you can look for. Let's take a look at the berries that have persisted over the winter into the early spring here. You'll see that they are red, very similar to Japanese barberry, but they're not nearly as elongated and oval in shape. All right, so they're more, they're a little bit slightly rounded and they have like the black tips at the end, as you can see here. So that's one of the features that can, that can help distinguish it. Let's take a look at some other features about multiflora rose that are slightly different. If you take a look at the thorn, to me, that looks like the dorsal fin or, so, or of, a, uh, of a shark or something. So it's more recurved and, and kind of a curve towards the back versus barb. Yeah, this is, the thorns are the real dead giveaway, right? This, it's like, think shark on multiflora rose versus barberry. It's just like a toothpick, right? Barberry, which has a very straight, almost toothpick shape to it. And if you can see behind that thorn, you see um, that there is almost what are called these fringed stipules at the base. So if you can... So I use the term stipule, and I forgot to mention that earlier in the talk, but the stipule is basically like a little structure that's found at the base of uh, the leaf stalk. And it's, it's usually has, just has some kind of key identification. It's like some sort of growth on the base of the leaf stalk that usually has some like key, good key identification features on it. And you're gonna see that this is what's gonna distinguish multiflora rose from some of the other native roses. We don't really have a lot of native roses growing wild, like Carolina rose. Um, I, I think I forgot the other one off the top of my head, but um, but this is what's going to distinguish it from some of the native roses. Is this fringe stipule? It looks like a little caterpillar at the base of the leaf. And see uh, if I can get my finger in there. See this little fringed, almost like uh, these fringe stipules, or the base of the of the leaf stalk here that connect to the to this branch here it's got those little like hairy projections on it or the word are called fringe certainly barberry doesn't have that and this is the distinguishing feature of multiflora rose so those are some of the features that you can look for to make sure that you're looking in fact at barberry and not multiflora rose okay so i'm going to summarize that in powerpoint and I'll, I'll take a closer look at what i'm referring to as this like the fringe stipules in a second so just another look at barberry right arching branches red fruit um, but like toothpick thorns and spoon shaped leaves multiflora rose is going to be blooming and maybe blooming in jersey now i don't know i, I i'm up in dutchess county and kind of like sequestered here so i but i think they're going to be blooming really soon um they are, again, an invasive perennial shrub, multiflora rose, usually grows to be about six, 10 feet tall, and they are like pervasive. Uh, it's like really all over the place. And they can form these impenetrably dense clusters of shrub that are very thorny. This is what the rose, you know, the roses are gonna be looking like uh, very soon, if not already. And this is that caterpillar-like looking thing that I was talking about, that the fringe stipule. That's a closer look at it there. Um, and just some of its other key ID features that we mentioned that sort of like dorsal fin shaped um, thorns to it, unlike Barberry, and uh, clusters of small white flowers that are blooming uh, now or in June, very soon. 
All righty. We are moving on. Wineberry. Wineberry is a multi-stem deciduous shrub that you may confuse with raspberries, but it is in fact a non-native species and really its main distinguishing features versus the native raspberries or blackberries is this like a reddish appearance to the stems and these fine hairs that you see on them. These are edible. Uh, people use them in jams and things. This is what the berry looks like. Um, and again, I think the, the best way of representing this is by showing you what it looks like actually in the field. So I'll show you a video of what wineberry looks like and uh, how to distinguish it. Again, you're going to get these curved arching branches of wineberry. I filmed this in like April. So just the main difference basically is that the leaves will be more filled out but uh, you'll still see the finest red hairs and the, and the arching branches right now. That's its main feature is the hairy branches. Canes. And actually these canes are capable of reproduction if, they, if and when they touch the soil and actually new uh, shoots can come out and reproduce that way as well as through seed dispersal. So let's take a closer look at some of these uh, key identifying features and uh, show you how it can be distinguished from some of the native raspberries and native blackberries that we have. Here you can really see the curved arch structure of these branches. But let's take a closer look at uh, what really distinguishes it from some of the native blackberries and raspberries are these really finest red hairs. You can see that the branch itself is red. Uh, sometimes it can be green, but certainly the hairs, the, these fine red hairs that come out are red and it turns red typically as it matures. You can see the thorns in there as well. Those thorns are pretty straight up and down, not like the curved thorns of multi flora rose. You can see the leaves that are next to it. So it's a compound leaf, so it means that the leaf itself is divided into three leaflets. You can see that there are three on this. Uh, the native blackberries, raspberries have anywhere between three and five. Um, and as usually as they grow older, those native ones will, will start to form into five. Uh, but here, the wineberry will have three. If I flip this upside down, you'll see that the underside is whitish and as this um as the wineberry matures it'll, it'll develop even wider um and that's just another key feature but really it's these reddish hairs that is unlike anything else that we'd find in the native in our forest here you're looking at the curved arch of native black raspberry but let's take a closer look and you'll see that it's not quite like wineberry and easy to distinguish so as we zoom in and get closer you will see that the stem and branch itself, it's very smooth. Yes, it's got the thorns that run along it, but if, you, if I move my thumb up and down here, there's none of those finest red hairs that distinguish it from it. And even though the leaves and the leaflets might look somewhat similar, it's really just the smooth part of this that, and wineberry would have those finest red hairs to it. So that's the easy way to tell apart. All right, so that's just a quick summary of wineberry versus some of the black rat. Whoops, yeah, yeah, wineberry versus black raspberries. The, uh, you'll see that raspberry like through that aggregate berry come out in July or August for wineberry. Um, and just, you know, again, look for whitish undersides, uh, you know, the, like, and just the hairs. Right? I mean, it's really like the hairs that, are, that there's nothing like that. You, you know, just look at, the, look at the stems. If it's got these finest red hairs on it, you know you're looking at wineberry. Um, just to summarize, you know, blackberries typically have a five part uh, compounds leaf to them. Red raspberries, um, they're, you know, have a more of a grayish underside to them and don't have those finest red hairs. And we mentioned the black raspberry has more um, like whitened stems oftentimes, uh, you know, and leaves are, are grayish more beneath, but it's really the finest red hairs that, that distinguish wineberry from anything else. Okay, our last shrub on our list is what is called burning bush. And that's a deciduous invasive shrub. And it's also like if you use some of the mobile apps like Seek or iNaturalist, it might refer to it as winged euonymus. And that is because it is distinguished by these quirky wings that it has on it. It's crazy. It looks like little cardboard coming off of the stems of this thing. 
Um, there's really nothing, nothing like it out there that, that it looks like. It's also called burning bush because it'll turn this like really nice reddish color um, in the fall, but you probably won't see that unless you're out in the fall and the leaves are turning red. Um, this is another look at it. Those leaves on it are, are serrated, but just a closer look at those corky wings that you'll find on it. There, it's like, that, that, that's really kind of like the main, the main key feature to be looking for. I would also say and be thinking about, um, if you look at the edge of the branches, they, a lot of people think that you got opposite leaf structure here. You can see that the, the leaves are coming off opposite of one another, but you see that the terminal end or the end of the branch, like if you looked at it a sideways or whatever, lots of people think it looks like a loppy, lo, lo, is it called loppy? Loppy bunny ears or something like coming off of the end. So like little rabbit ears that are coming off of the end of the branches and opposite leaf structure. You can look for the serrations on the leaves as well, bright reddish color in the, um, on, on the leaves themselves with little, little bumps and serrations. So those are some of the main key features of what you are looking for when you're looking for burning bush, but it's really like the corky wing structure that is really, really key and distinguishes it from, from others um, in our region. Okay. In the interest of time, I, I will go on to our next category, which are the vines. So we actually have quite a few vines that we'll be looking for. The first of which is like everybody, ha it's like it's everywhere. Um, and it's Oriental Bittersweet. And you're going to learn like what it looks like if you don't know it already. It is extremely difficult to get rid of, but you can, you, you, through like volunteer removal days, you can at least cut the vine where it's coming off of the main trees and help save the trees, but it's hard to get rid of the roots. The roots will clamp, the, are, are orangish if you're trying to pull this out of say your garden or something like that. Um, and you know, they are just really distinguished by basically wrapping around and suffocating trees. Before we get into the specifics on bittersweet, I'm gonna do an overall, overall orientation for you guys, just on vines in general, because one of the main things I really want to make sure that everybody on this call knows is that you, what poison ivy looks like in its main different forms. If you're seeing a vine and you like have that urge, like, oh, Brent told me to look, look at the leaves or whatever, like, and then touch them, like, be very careful. Do, uh, that you are not touching poison ivy. So I'm gonna do a little overview of the vines right now and show you some of the things to look for and what poison ivy looks like versus some of the other vines. And then we'll get into bittersweet and what, the, what that looks like. So I'll let this play for a little while. Look, at, here is a vine look-alike alert. What we are looking at here is poison ivy. And one of the ways you can tell is that poison ivy, especially as it matures, has a lot of hairs as it goes up the tree. You can see all that hairy structure to that. The invasive vines that we have, like Oriental Bittersweet, don't have those hairs associated with it. Another telltale sign that is poison ivy, if I look at a younger vine that's coming up the tree here, are the three leaves that are coming off of it. Right now, in early May, it's kind of got a reddish, greenish look to it, but Definitely, if it's got three leaves, stay away from it. This is what the younger vine looks like, and you can see that it's getting a little bit hairy, but nothing like the big mature vine that you see over here. You can also see that poison ivy has a lot of different growth structures to it. Look at this one that's coming off almost as a branch. And the way I can tell that's poison ivy is again by counting the three leaves. I can see what it's attached to. It's attached to this hairy vine here. One way to remember that is the phrase, don't be a dope and touch the hairy rope. Stay away from it. The other way to tell that it's poison ivy. The other phrase that I've learned is uh, leaves of three, let it be. And not bittersweet. It's that bittersweet corkscrews as it goes up the tree. You see how poison ivy is just kind of, it's meandering a little bit, but it's not corkscrewing around this big tree. Oriental bittersweet will corkscrew up the tree and really kind of strangle it out. Poison ivy just tends to grow more, a little bit straighter, even though it can meander like a river. Here's a good close-up look of the vines of Oriental bittersweet. And the reason you can tell is it is actually a couple of different ways. You see how it's wrapping around this tree in a corkscrew fashion? 
So it's twisting and wrapping around almost like a python that's going up this. It's actually can even wrap around itself. You might even see these dark knobs with again, a couple of different vines that are wrapping around it itself. Also, I will notice, you will notice that it has a lot of dots on it. Now it depends on the age of that vine as to whether you'll see those. But those are lenticels and ways of uh, oxygen exchange uh, in inside and outside of the vine. And uh, that's another distinguishing feature of it. You got to look, it's, it's almost like dotted with those. Um, but again, that depends on the vine. You can see that all throughout here. But you're really looking for that corkscrew pattern. I did want to point out that right below it is poison ivy. And again, poison ivy with the three leaves. So there's poison ivy going just below it here. But that's all that twistiness right there. That is classic of Oriental Bittersweet. We are filming this right now at the beginning of May, and you can just see, like even, even the branches that are coming out of this twisting vine here, you can see that the leaves are starting to form. And again, so this is what the leaf structure will look like. You can see that there's little teeth at the edge of the leaf, so that's, that's another class. That's one of the features I'm looking for. So this is what a younger Bittersweet would look like, um, and I'll show you what the mature leaves look like, but you're looking for teeth on the out, outside and sort of like an ovalish, like oblong oval shape to it. Sick way to look at it. So, but as this continues to grow and the growing season comes on, you can see that those leaves are growing in clusters. These will open up a bit. And I'm just looking for almost like that, that oval shaped look to it um, with a little, like the tip at the ends. Whoops, if it comes back into focus. Yeah, I see this got like, comes kind of to a point, but you're looking for the teeth on it. So the teeth on the edge, Kind of growing out of this cluster here, but it's really that wrapping around like a big python that you're looking for that distinguishes it from, say, poison ivy, which tends to meander, or even Virginia creeper that tends to meander as well. Look for that coarse growing pattern. I also wanted to show you a younger version of bittersweet and, and what it looks like. You can see that the that the bark um, on this stem here is a little, um, it's, it's like reddish brown. And you can see that the lenticels on this are, are more white or those bumps that you're seeing for um, gas exchange are white. You can see the leaf clusters again. And if you zoom in very closely, you can see that there are two little tipped points on the leaves, okay? So when this starts growing out, you'll see that the leaves are arranged alternately as well. So they're not gonna be opposite of one another um, as this begins to grow out. The other feature of the younger branches that I wanted to point out, we'll go over here. It's a little more obvious. So bittersweet, again, as a vine, is looking for something to wrap around, right? In that corkscrew fashion. So what you'll often see are these things that are called leaders. So you see how this is almost like, it's like a snake kind of perched up like a cobra looking for something. Um, so I, it's sort of like the snake-like appearance. These leaders will come off of the main, you know, the, off of the main stem um, and be looking to wrap itself around something. You can see that this bittersweet here is wrapping around itself. So uh, almost this corkscrew twisting around itself. You, it's just, it's very nefarious. Like those leaders are always looking for purchase and they are very good at their job. You can see how it's all tangled. So this is what the younger version of Bittersweet will look like. And I, I just pulled it off, but it was all actually about to wrap around this garlic mustard that you're seeing below me as well. So those are some of the features of the younger Bittersweet. So more white lenticels, the bark is slightly different. Um, and uh, looking for these leaders, these almost like snake-like leaders that are looking for a place to wrap around. It's very nefarious. Here's another good look at those leaders I was telling you about in another part of the forest that I'm in right now. You can see those like little branches. It's actually wrapping around itself. And you see how it's that snake-like appearance uh, in the fore foreground and also the background of this plant. You know, it's totally taken over here. There's another one that's coming down. Again, looking for uh, to wrap itself around, around itself. You can see on this like fallen tree trunk or, or log or whatever this is, you know, this is just a tangle of bittersweet. So you'll often see this kind of coming down to the ground and roots being, you know, established and then coming up and looking for purchase. But those are what the, the leaders look like. So that's another clear example of bittersweet. Here's another twisted mess. Um, how do you disentangle this, uh, the pun aside there, as to what we are looking at here? Well, a lot of it is bittersweet, but how can you tell? There's another vine in here that you may confuse it with. So again, if we're looking for the kind of the rougher bark here, looking for lenticels, this is mostly uh, 
bittersweet that you're seeing here. But if you come over here, you'll see that the bittersweet um, is actually wrapping itself around something that looks slightly different. You see this shaggier bark here. I can actually be so shaggy that I can peel it off. Well, this is what a grapevine looks like. They almost, uh, you'll see them in a lot of the forests around here. They almost look like Tarzan swinging types. Um, but this is what uh, the native grapevines look like. You can uh, pull off the bark. It's very stringy, okay? So this is bittersweet. Again, you can tell by the corkscrewing that it's doing around this grapevine here. Um, here's another. All right, so yeah, that's like grapevines are, are a good way, another one to look at. And then the last vine that you might see amongst trees is Virginia creeper. A lot of people aren't allergic to Virginia creeper, but some are. So just be careful when you're pulling vines off. Here is Virginia creeper or five-leaved ivy or five-fingered ivy, maybe. Um, there's a couple of different names for it. But again, the way to tell the difference is you'll see that the leaf structure is actually quite different than poison ivy or bittersweet or some of the other invasive vines that you'll see here. Um, this is not poisonous like poison ivy. Uh, you can pull it off the tree, although I would recommend using gloves, pulling off any ivy off of the tree. Um, but again, you're looking for the five leaf structure to this and Virginia creeper is native in the Northeast and it is a vine that you might see on some of the trees around here and is not to be confused with poison ivy or some of the invasive vines. Uh, so yeah, you're looking for, if you've got five leaves, it's Virginia creeper, three poison ivy, and then bittersweet are the, are the simple leaves that are alternately arranged. Remember that like the grapevine image that I showed you before? I just yesterday, I went to that same location. I just wanted to show you what that looks like nowadays because bittersweet does look different when it gets a little bit older. So just want to check this out. That tangled mess of vines that I showed you in the beginning of May, this is the same exact area now at the end of May. I just wanted to show you what has happened to this. Again, you- Can you believe how much greener things got in just a few weeks? It's crazy. <laughs> bittersweet along with that those grapevines that I showed you before but this is what the bittersweet le leaves will actually start to look like they're much like bigger deeper you can clearly see the teeth at the end um, but just a slightly different structure from what I showed you in the original video um, you can see that it's starting to you know the there's they're starting to be some blooms here that are going to appear very shortly you can look at look at it above as well but just to show you a perspective as like how it changes over time um, this is end of May now same thing yeah so like that was a really detailed look at all the vines you might come across but um, again the only other thing I'll say about bittersweet is it's red Red berries, um, if you go out later in the year, you might see some of the red berries that are, that are appearing. But really looking for those lenticels and the coarse screwing appearance wrapping around the tree. All right, yeah, and you'll notice that when I did the difference, you see how like the younger leaves were a little bit pointier and more like tooth versus like the older ones that I just showed you. They're a little bit like rounder and bigger. Okay. On to another vine that's on our list. This is Mile a Minute, and this is kind of a cool looking one, but it's devastating. Um, you can get these dense mats of it that just completely cover the forest thunderstory. Um, but what it's really known for, and I'll point out in a second here, is it's highly distinctive equilateral triangle leaf shape. It's like so geometric, it's crazy. It's like, it's like a, almost like a perfect triangle. You can really see it here as a flat base and then that triangle appearance. The only other thing that I will note about it is that it has a really, really long leaf stalk and it's got curved prickles that run along that, that uh, along the stem and the leaf stalk. So if you were feeling it, it would almost like stick to your fingers. And the other thing is that it has a stipule that is rounded in shape and almost like at a certain joint. Mile a minute is like a mint greenish in color. It can form like dense mats. It tends to not climb up like bittersweet or something does versus this kind of grows out more horizontally and creates these like dense mats. I could not find a picture. I could not find it in the wild around me, but I do have, I did take, um, a video of it yesterday in a potted plant, just so you can see some of those features I was referring to. 
I could not find Mile a Minute around me in a natural area, but I do have a potted version of it. So you can really see that triangular leaf is going to be your main key for Mile a Minute. And if I zoom in, I just wanted to show you the level of detail on these prickles that run all along that leaf stalk, right? And I can feel it even at the base of this leaf here if I turned it around. There's also these like finish prickles as I run, run my thumb along it. If I follow that leaf stalk down, you'll see that like nice feature that stipule at the base of the leaf stalk it's rounded so these are really the key features that are going to distinguish mile a minute triangular leaves prickles along each leaf stalk and then these roundish features uh, as a stipule at the base of that leaf stalk so again just the zoomed out version of it and this is going to all right so hopefully that's helpful to you guys just to see it in action the only other feature that you might see if you go out in late july is, uh, or later, like later in the summer, August, you might see the uh, blue fruit that starts to appear um, around that stipule area. So it's, it's kind of a, a neat um, distinguishing feature of this that, I, that you see like early fall, late summer in our, in our area, but you won't see that now. We also, just to let you guys know, we used to have a mile a minute project and it was called what is called a biocontrol project where there are these uh, stem boring weevils that look like this that the only thing they eat is mile a minute and so we had a program where we released these and you might see if you come across mile a minute some of the holes in it and that means that these weevils are doing their job and trying to control the spread of mile a minute in our region they feed on the leaves and also like the um, the nodes of each of the stems so just kind of a cool feature. These weevils are really small. That's a penny <laughs> for uh, scale comparison. Um, there's not many lookalikes. I mean, people might confuse maybe like a bindweed or something, which is, but they're more like shovel shaped and they don't have like thorns or prickles on the stem, but they're more like spade shaped to them versus like the equilateral triangle of mile a minute. Um, there are tear thumbs, but you see like the base of this is just not that like equilateral triangle look to it. So you, you'll, you'll be pretty confident that you're seeing mile a minute if you see it. Just, there's nothing like those triangle leaves. The other vine on our list is something called Japanese honeysuckle. Many of you guys might recognize honeysuckles in general from its flowers. So the flowers of honeysuckle or, or the bush or shrub version of honeysuckle, which is not on our list, are really, in, I'm in Dutchess County in New York right now and they are blooming like crazy here. Um, you might see them, they, the, the distinctive feature of the honeysuckles are these flowers, they bloom in pairs at the base of the leaves, but it's really this like opposite leaf structure and with the vine version of it, it's like a reddish stem to it. And to me, that opposite leaf structure, they look like um, propellers on an airplane or something. You see how they're like almost like airplane pro propellers or something? I don't know, it, it looks like that to me. And the flowers themselves grow at, as pairs next to or at the base of the leaves that also grow opposite in pairs over each other. So you might see bush honeysuckle, which is actually really common. And they are also have this like peeled banana flower look to them. Um, but this, the vine version really tends to sprawl out. Just like mile a minute kind of sprawls out horizontally on the forest floor. Um, and the leaves themselves are smooth margins. You might see like reddish, tiny reddish hair, or not reddish, but um, Red, you know, reddish stems, but fine hairs coming off that reddish stem on it. And they can really like, they, they twirl around things and can cause a lot, a lot of issues. So you're looking for opposite leaf structure, almost looking like airplane propellers coming off. And it's uh, like a reddish stem to them. Okay, guys, you are almost there. Almost there, we're on to herbaceous plants. You guys have been awesome. Uh, we got 15 minutes left. We're going to end around on time, I think, because we've got just a couple of herbaceous plants that I wanted to show you today. So two more to go. The first herbaceous plant is another awful, notorious um, invasive species. And if you've seen this, uh, this is a scourge in Europe. In fact, it is 
completely and totally banned in Europe. I think you can go to jail for having this on your property, actually, in Europe, in, in, in England, I think. Uh, Japanese knotweed is like, it looks like bamboo uh, and really grows in this distinct zigzag-like formations, really, really thick colonies of this. You'll also often find it in disturbed ground, primarily in sun, dry or wet soils. I find it a lot along, and that's the problem with it. It reproduces by like fragmentation. So like just little parts of this if, are left behind. It'll just sprout up again. It's very, very difficult to get rid of. And it also survives in water. So it can really take over. On this next slide, I'll really kind of zoom in on its main features. The way that I can tell it apart is it's got like, a really flat base to it, to the leaf. The leaves can be really big. Like they can be like larger, much larger than my head even. Um, a flat base and a really fine pointed tip to it. You'll notice that when you're looking at knotweed, that it has this zigzag like appearance to almost like a bamboo like structure to it. Um, it does welcome a lot of pollinators to it. But it's so it's so invasive, guys, that it's not worth it's not worth it. There's plenty of other natives that our pollinators can use other than knotweed, and it's very very difficult to get rid of. Um, I just wanted to show you close up of like what it looks like out in the fields. Give me a second to kind of manipulate my screen here. Let's see if I can get to a key part where you can really kind of see its its main features here. Give me a second. Where is it? Oh, there it is. Okay, there you go. That's me standing next to one. And control the spread in our region. One of the key identifying characteristics of knotweed are its oddly shaped leaves. You can see it here. It's almost like a, um, like a shield shape or uh, the shape of a shovel, as people say. You can see that it's almost flat towards the back or where the leaf stalk is or the petiole is. And it's kind of got a pointed end, uh, almost like you're like the end of a shovel or, so, or something. You can also see next to it, it's got this like reddish, purplish um, and green, um, almost like bamboo-like uh, stem to it. And this is a really distinguishing characteristic of it. If I, if I look at the bigger stand over here, you can see it's it's the way that it tends to grow in its growth pattern, um, especially as it as it tends to sprawl. You almost see like a, a zig -like, zigzag like pattern to it. You can see it in this one here, where it almost goes like up and then to the right and to the left. So that zig -like, zigzag like appearance is another key characteristic of it. So you're looking for almost those bamboo-like stems, the reddish purplish stems as well, and they're almost like shovel shaped or shield shaped leaves on it. This All right, so that just gives you another perspective on what it looks like. The leaves, again, I, as I said, are I can be actually really quite big. Okay, back to PowerPoint. Just another look at its key ID features. And um, again, you're not gonna see the flowers that you see there now. I gotta look at my notes here. I think the flowers will come out around August, September time. You'll start to see it uh, flowering out in our region. Okay, uh, so getting to our last two now, I, I forgot there was one more, uh, garlic mustard. So garlic mustard is everywhere. Um, I'm sure you have it on your property. And the only thing I want to mention about it that makes it kind of unique is that it has, it's a, it's a biennial. So it means that it goes through two years of growth. And its first year actually looks really, really different from its second year. Its first year of growth is a rosette form that almost looks like U-shaped base, very variable in size. Some of the rosettes can be huge, and I'll show you a, a video of that in a second. But its second year of growth, it does what is called bolting straight upwards. And it'll take on a more like triangular shape to it. And then you'll start to see like right now, you'll see the white flowers. It's uh, really obvious. And you'll see the little pods that come out of it. These are called salix and they contain the seeds in them. And it's kind of scary. Like they reproduce by ballistic propulsion of these seeds. They shoot out the seeds like ballistically. And that's why it's so good at spreading and reproducing. And 
Uh, the flowers you, you'll see now, but are gonna disappear and then the second year of growth will die very soon, but it leaves behind these like husks of the salix that turn like, um, I don't know, like brownish in color, but they're left behind, like almost like ghosts of its former self. Um, I took this video yesterday, so you'll see kind of what it looks like in our area of what, how, to, how to distinguish garlic mustard and the differences between the two years of growth. Here is a whole field of garlic mustard. And you can tell it, um, again, that remember that garlic mustard, as I said in the PowerPoint, is a biennial plant. And so it has two distinct years that look completely different from one another. So I'm filming this towards the end of May, and you can see the second year of garlic mustard. It grows almost straight up in the air. Um, the leaves on it are actually pretty triangular, and you can tell that it's garlic mustard just by crunching it up in your hand, smelling it. Yep, smells like garlic, and you can see that the white flowers are pretty prevalent on it right now. What these are here are, these are called saliques, um, this kind of like stalk-like appearance to it, and uh, they will, uh, they contain the seeds, and they actually have ballistic propulsion, and will shoot the seeds out. Um, eventually, once um very soon this will actually die off and then it'll just sort of like leave behind the stalks of this they'll turn sort of a brownish color and then you won't be able to recognize it towards the end of the summer early fall but right now is a great time to view and see garlic mustard and you can see it's just totally taken over the uh ground cover here i also wanted to point out what his first year of growth looks like this is the rosette stage so in his first year of growth it's much lower to the ground. Um, you know, this is a couple of inches off the ground here. Um, and this is like a huge rosette. But you can see that it's... Or remember, just keep looking at my thumb for scale, like so how big these things are. Like U-shaped or like almost like horseshoe-shaped. The strong That sort of sense of um, smell of garlic is even stronger on this now if you crush this up. But you're really looking for that like U-shaped to its first year of growth. Sometimes they'll be really big like this, but you can see like right next to it, some of the other rosettes are much, much smaller. So just a couple of different things to be on the lookout for when you're thinking about garlic mustard and looking for it. So first year and then a second year of growth looks actually really different. Second year, much more triangular leaves. In the first year of growth, it's really like more of like U-shaped, horseshoe-shaped, or many people say like kidney-shaped look to it. So, All right. So there you have it. Garlic mustard is everywhere. Um, and the good thing is that garlic mustard is easy to pull. So if you've got it on your property, just make sure you're getting it by the roots. Um, and uh, you can kind of start, start hammering away at getting rid of that on your property. Um, in terms of the survey work, we can encourage people to remove it from the trails or parks simply because um, you know you have to work with the parks to actually do any control on it. But that's why we can organize volunteer removal days and, and go through the parks to actually do it. But certainly garlic mustard is something you can start removing from your own properties. Okay, the only other thing that garlic mustard might look alike is uh, our violets. So violets, however, as opposed to like the U shape, really have a point to the end to them. And they look like more heart shaped leaves versus the rosettes of garlic mustard are more like u-shaped and rounded and like have these like bumps on the end but violets have really kind of come to a point at the end so people can also confuse it with ground ivy but you're not going to see ground ivy a lot on the trails this is more of what you might see on your own properties but and that's distinguished by you know the purplish flowers i'm sure you've seen i have it a lot on my my, my lawn uh with ground ivy uh but it doesn't grow nearly as tall as garlic mustard does. All right, guys, you are, we are on our last species. You have made it this far. One more to go. Japanese stillgrass, another really highly invasive uh, uh, herbaceous grass. Um, this is uh, distinguished is just starting to appear now on the forest floor, but soon it's gonna be very, very prevalent. You're looking for like a mint greenish color. And it's uh, right now it's very low lying. I'll show you a video. You actually might have seen it in that garlic mustard video in the same area there was still grass there. It's a very light green grass. Eventually you're not gonna see it now, uh, but later in the season, if you go out surveying like a month from now, 
you'll start to see that this grass is noted by a silvery stripe down the middle of the blade of that grass. So that's going to be key. And it kind of, it's called stilt grass, it grows straight up on stilts. And then you'll see like the, the blade of the, of the leaves are kind of coming off like alternate from, from each other, from that main blade that's coming out of, out of, the, out of the ground. Um, it forms really, really dense lawns and patches. The good thing about it is that you, and you'll know like it's very weak stems. You can pull it right, the roots, like right out um, of, of the ground, but very, very hard to get rid of and travels very fast. It can certainly take over an area very quickly. This is the last video I'm gonna show you today. This I took yesterday. We, the re, actually, Japanese stillgrass is the reason why we can't start surveying till early June because it doesn't actually pop up out of the ground till right around now. But this is what it looked like just yesterday um, in an area that I was. In this same field of garlic mustard, you're also going, I don't know if you saw another invasive species here, but this is Japanese stillgrass and it's all over this area in which I'm out in, in the forest right here. Um, and again, right now, Japanese stillgrass is just starting to grow. It's got kind of a lime green appearance to it and actually won't have that distinctive silver stripe on it. But just to put my thumb down there for reference, uh, just to show you, but this is all stillgrass, lime green appearance. You can see that the main blade of grass you know, it's really easy to pull out. That's what the roots are going to look like. Um, and you can see that there's like the main blades are kind of coming off alter. You see what I mean? Like this is the, this is the stilt part that shoots straight up and then there's a blade coming off there and then another one coming off there. That's the, that's key feature of stilt on that, on the primary part of the grass. Um, and almost like look like left, right, left, right, kind of those blades of grass coming out. Really easy to pull out, unlike some of the other grasses, um, but very, very prevalent. You can see it's just all around here. And on forests around you, if you're seeing a lot of this like matted, dense grass, that especially at this time of year is low to the ground, it's most likely going to be still grass. And I would recommend, so you get the hang of like recognizing what it is, you seek on it. Seek does a really nice job of recognizing Japanese still grass. So just wanted to show. If you don't know what I'm referring to, I can give you videos as to how it, I've created tutorials. If you guys have taken the citizen science webinar with me, we've gone over you seek an eye naturalist. And these are like really, really great tools for you guys that you can use um, to help you with the IDs in addition to the field guides that I'm going to provide for you. Um, seek an eye naturalist with all of these common species are, are phenomenal. And Seek does it in real time. You basically just hold up your phone to what you're looking at and shows you in real time. And it's a great confidence builder for first time surveyors. And if you do want help with that and getting that going, I highly, highly recommend it um, as an app to use with you in addition to the field guides I'll be providing to you. Um, yeah, uh, June growth. Yeah, I, I basically showed you this, this image here. There's not much else to see. I mean, after, um, you know, it will end, end, eventually end up dying. This is what it looks like. You can see that still grass can grow actually like pretty tall. And this is what it looks like once it's died off for the year. Um, the only other thing it might look like are white grasses, but, or like, you know, the main, a lot of the grasses, if they're growing in like big tufts or like patchy, it's not going to be still grass. Like still grass is like really dense and really covers an area versus like a lot of the other grasses, um, they grow more sparsely and they pop up um, like in a patch here and then another patch there or whatever. Um, white grasses have no silvery stripe and have these little tuft of hair, but it's most likely if you're seeing mint green and it's forest coverage and on the forest understory, you're going to have still grass, but use your mobile apps to just to help confirm that. All right, that's pretty much it guys. Uh, and again, like, you will have, I'm gonna provide a whole bunch of resources for you in the next couple of days, including a taped version of this webinar. Um, and really, once you've developed a search image, you're gonna be equipped with mobile apps that can help you with the IDs. Um, and you're gonna be able to do this, I guarantee it. Like, you, once you practice and get out there and take that risk to get out there and do it, you are going to accomplish this. Like it's, it's, it becomes really fun and almost addictive. To be honest with you, I've learned so much by running this program about what is living around us in terms of biodiversity. Uh, it be, it's just really fun, fun to do it. In terms of next steps, um, I will be in touch. So I'm gonna give you a, uh, so 
right now, all I've done is essentially like give you the IDs. Um, I'm going to be sending out the uh, color, well, I'll show that in the next slide, but a color copy guide. Um, but the last thing that you guys need to do is that we only talked about IDs in like the, the um, context of the program and what you guys are trying to accomplish. But I have a taped version of a webinar that basically goes through the data collection procedures like how to actually collect data and how to like report what you're seeing and like what a data sheet looks like and all of that. So as opposed to having you guys attend another webinar where it's a structured time, I'm going to send you a link to a recording of that and you guys can watch it on your own time and learn about how to, how to collect data and what we require from you. And I'll send you the data sheets and stuff. And then I just ask that once you have seen the data collection protocol, essentially like, that webinar, you just write me an email and like, hey, Brent, I'm ready. I saw it. I'm ready to go. You can now send me what it, like my trail assignment and uh, I'll be ready to survey for you. So um, that's how we're going to do it as opposed to having a scheduled webinar like we did today. It'll be on your own time uh, and you can, you can watch it at your leisure as to how to collect the data. Um, basically, prior to your field assignment, you'll have to do that data protocol webinar. And then you're gonna, after, in the next couple of days, I'm going to send out a full color field guide of all the species. You'll get access to this webinar. You'll get a link to the data protocol webinar. And you're gonna have access to our digital library. All of those videos that I spliced together, you will have access to those if you wanted to just see specific species that you wanted reviewing. And of course, you're gonna have access to me for questions. Essentially, once you are done and you're like, oh, I, I saw the data collection protocol webinar. I've got my field guides. I'm feeling good. I'm ready to go. I'm going to give out an assignment to you in a park that's convenient. So, you know, depending on where you live or like what park you want to explore, you need to fill out a survey for us. Like, I would love to work in this park. Are there any trails available that I can survey there? I'll give out an assignment to you. In the data collection protocol webinar, I will teach you that's that the whole part of that webinar is basically like uh, what my email to you when you're, of your trail assignment is going to look like, how you get it into your phone, how to use like how to, how to record your points and all of that. And then you're going to have the whole summer to early fall to complete it. So you can do it at your leisure. Some people like to knock it off in a weekend and then take on another assignment. Others, you know, take their time and you know, spend like an hour here, an hour there until they've, they, until they've marched through their whole trail assignment. And, uh, you know, and then at that point when you're done, you're gonna return your data to us. And I explain that all in the follow-up webinar to this as to how to, how to, what to do with your data and where it goes and, and that sort of stuff. And then when you're done, you're gonna receive a t-shirt from us, many thanks, congratulations, all that kind of good stuff. And just, you should feel really, really proud of what you've accomplished. So with that, I am here for questions. You guys have been awesome audience. And um, you know, I will now spend some time and I'll stay on until I answer all, all the questions that come at me. Um, I will stop the recording part of this right now, um, just so that we have a, like a nice clean version that I can send to you guys when we're done here. And um, then we'll go from there. But basically, if you have any questions, contact us at invasives at nynjtc.org or contact me at Brent uh, at my personal email, which is bboscarino at nynjtc.org. With that, I'll look to the chat box. Since there's still a lot of us on this, I'll do it through the chat box. And then once uh, people start signing off, I can answer questions that if you have verbal questions or whatever, but I will speak to the whole group and try to address as many questions as I can and we'll stay on until I'm through them, okay? But uh, that ends the webinar. You feel free to sign off, but if you did want to listen to some of these questions, you, you can stay on for as long as you are ready.